The tallest mountain range on Earth, the Himalayas, yields some of the rarest natural products in the world, like hallucinogenic honey that costs $300 per bottle. In Kashmir, farmers harvest saffron, one of the priciest spices ever. And hidden in these rocks is a substance some people call natural Viagra. So why are products on this mountain chain, which spans five different countries, so valuable? The world's most expensive spice comes from this flower, and it takes about 150,000 of them to make just one kilo of saffron, a kilo that costs $3,000. Here in Kashmir, saffron is an important part of the economy and cultural identity. It has many uses, including religious purposes, for pharmacological purposes, for culinary, as a spice, as a mood enhancer. But Kashmir's saffron industry is facing a crisis in recent years, farms hit with drought and rising temperatures have lost 65% of their normal yields. And the supply chain is riddled with imitation saffron. Gardenia flower or safflower is being sold as saffron. Corn, silk or tissue paper, plastics, but that is not saffron at all. The Indian government launched initiatives to try and help but the farmers we spoke to say they haven't been enough. All of this combined has left farmers frustrated and driven some out of the industry. We went to Kashmir to see if there's a future for the region's red gold. Saffron comes from these three tiny strands called stigmas found in this purple flower, the crocus sativus. The crocus can only be grown in a handful of locations. Kashmir is one of the only places in India with the right conditions to grow saffron. And farmers have grown it here for 3,500 years. That's Ashik. His family's been growing crocus flowers here for nearly a century. Once planted, the flowers need about two years to mature before they can produce good saffron. Come October, a sheik heads out to hand harvest the delicate purple flowers. Almost everyone helping is related to him. Since the flowers don't bloom all at once, just five years ago, a sheik could harvest for an entire month. But his crop is shrinking. This year, with fewer flowers, the harvest ended in just six days. Ashik's farm is not unique. He's getting hit with the same climate and political issues affecting the entire region. Climate change is definitely, definitely having an effect. The temperature, uh, earlier it used to be a bit cold this time around the season when the saffron uh, harvest would take place. But now it's very warm, so that has affected saffron badly. Saffron needs cold soil to grow, yet Kashmir's temperature has risen by 1.45 degrees Celsius in the last 20 years and the rains. We had very few uh, rains in the last, I think, four or five years. When the rains do come, they're more intense. In 2014, heavy flooding washed away the saffron crop, and saffron farmers are still reeling from the severe drought in 2018 that dried out the soil. quality impact but quantity impact time, productivity then there are the political issues. Kashmir is a disputed region between India and Pakistan. But India administers the part where saffron grows. In 2019, the Indian government implemented an internet and communication blackout. That, coupled with the pandemic lockdowns the following year, caused saffron farmers and the supply chain to suffer. Over the past decade, saffron production was so low, the government launched the National Saffron Mission. The goal of the $53 million mission was to revive the saffron crop. It promised to rejuvenate saffron bulbs and build irrigation systems to fight drought. But many farmers say the mission hasn't helped as promised. I think my experience regarding saffron is Of the 124 wells the National Saffron Mission promised to dig, the government says 121 were installed. A sheik's farm got one of those wells but he says it never worked. Saffron mission. 
ये आप देखिए ना मतलब जब से लगाया तब से यही पे है ऐसे ही है कोई ये नहीं है And farmers had to pay for these irrigation systems. Paas paas saas rupee metro man se mian se takriban dood lakh rupee yeh manish. Kama nish. Agriculture wale nish ast mian dood lakh rupee. Metro agar is zindas trahan kanalan mein astri tien pane pane gusyo di dood lakh rupee chhu mian. Na shee mais divan irrigation win ke san at yeh ab to na shee divan tim kuch vaapas. Suhail, who works on the saffron mission, says that's because when the government tried to install irrigation systems, we faced. Uh, Uh, stern uh, resistance from certain farmers because they felt if we cut open the the soil it would somehow deplete the quality of saffron the mission claims saffron production has rebounded this would not had been possible if national mission on saffron would not had been there but these farmers aren't experiencing the production growth the government is reporting aaj khali khali sa zameen pada hai yet ashik has continued his family's saffron tradition in the evenings after harvesting सारी फैमिली एक साथ बैठ के ये रेड स्टिग्मा जिसको हम रेड गोल्ड कहते हैं इसका जो है वो निकालते हैं द स्टिग्मा आर फ्रैजल सो दे हैव टू बी रिमूव्ड बाय हैंड ये मेरे पापा है अभी हम ये कर रहे हैं ये ऑर्डर आया है दो ढाई सौ ग्राम का ऑर्डर आया है तो अभी हम वही बना रहे देन द स्टिग्मा लेस वैल्यूबल येलो टिप्स आर खर ऑफ ये जो प्रोसेस है इसमें से वो जो लवर पार्ट है वो रेड रेड स्टिग्मा का वो बाहर निकलता है वो ये आगे गिर जाता है ठीक है और रेड स्टिग्मा इसी में पड़ जाता है द रेड स्टिग्मा हाउस इज द कैरेक्टरिस्टिक कॉम्पाउंड्स दैट गिव सैफरॉन इट्स बिटर टेस्ट एंड अरोमा वंस इट्स ड्राइड द सैफरॉन कैन बी पैकेज्ड अप इट टेक्स अ शीक एंड हिज डैड 2 एंड 1/2 आवर्स टू प्रोसेस एनफ सैफरॉन फॉर जस्ट दिस टाइनी कंटेनर द अमाउंट ऑफ वर्क रिक्वायर्ड कंट्रीब्यूट्स टू द स्पाइसेस हाई प्राइस फॉर्म में ब्रोकर को बेचता है ब्रोकर जो है वो फॉर्म को बेचता है राइट और फॉर्म है कि उनके पास रजिस्ट्रेशन होती है वो ऑल ओवर इंडिया बेच सकते हैं 15 इयर्स अगो अशीक्स फैमिली कुड मेक 4000 डॉलर्स फॉर इट्स ईयरली सैफरॉन हार्वेस्ट टुडे अशीक ब्रिंग्स इन जस्ट अबाउट 900 डॉलर्स अ सीजन वंस इट हिट्स द मार्केट कैशमेरी सैफरॉन फेसेस अनदर प्रॉब्लम फेक सैफरॉन व्हाट्स इज सोल्ड इन द नेम ऑफ सैफरॉन इज इलीगली डाइड कॉर्न सिल्क or tissue paper plastics which are not fit for human consumption and made to look identical to saffron counterfeiters have also turned to safflower to pass off as saffron but the plant has a completely different taste because of saffron's high price counterfeiters can make a hefty chunk of change a layman cannot differentiate visually a source of much of the misleading products is iran which produces 90% of the world's saffron people may use pure kashmir saffron adulterated with maybe iranian saffron which comes to a very cheap rates to india iranian saffron can cost 48% less than kashmir's which is considered more aromatic and nutritious overall it's bad for the whole saffron industry and especially for the kashmir saffron farmers that their name gets tarnished to help raise prices Two years ago, the government saffron mission created this trading center called the Saffron Park. We are the guardians or custodians of the GI of Kashmir saffron. The Saffron Park's main goal was to help identify and stop fake saffron. Instead of selling on the open market, farmers could now drop off their saffron harvest at the center for storing and authentication. We do not accept saffron in dried form in this trade center. We only accept fresh flowers to be brought to the collection center, so that we ensure that the flowers are grown in the fields and saffron farms of Kashmir. In the lab, scientists can test to make sure the saffron is real. They first do a water test. Threads of saffron are put into water or milk. It should give very slowly release a yellow color. and not an instant coloring of red or orange color and that is a purity test for saffron but they also use machines to look for levels of saffron's characteristic compounds if it's proven fake it's thrown out and if it's real saffron it gets packaged up with a gi tag geographic indication certificate saffron of india is the only saffron in the world who has been given this certificate just like champagne only comes from a specific part of france and gi tag saffron should be taken as an authentic pure kashmiri saffron the center then markets the saffron and sells it online through its new auction site every saffron bottle is traceable to the farmer and his land it has been a very successful model of e-auction that we have tried 
Muzamel says saffron that would normally sell for $1,300 on the open market can sell for $3,000 through the center. It is 2.5 times what they used to get. Then they have a channel. They don't have any middlemen. They, they just grow it and then sell it off and go back to their homes with, with their money. Suhel said the center has been a success and works with 35% of Kashmir saffron farmers, or about 6,000 families. We are doing good. I'm damn sure we are building on their trust. We are giving them economic stability. We are giving them a better value of their produce. But not everyone's convinced. Bashik said he doesn't trust giving his crop to a center. The industry's woes have driven some farmers in Kashmir to leave the saffron business altogether. Six thousand families have left the saffron industry. Reports say many have shifted to apple and almond growing. The National Saffron Mission hopes to turn things around. We have had major setbacks. We are fighting it. There should be acknowledgement of our efforts. If everything goes well, two to three years, this mission would be done and dusted. Because ultimately, the goal among farmers and the government is the same, to save Kashmiri saffron. This is a cultural identity of Kashmir and especially the people of Pampur. I feel very proud, you know, to be a part of the area which grows saffron. But the thing is that, you know, the, the production is declining. It really disheartens me. Everything is at stake as far as this crop we grow is, is concerned. We cannot let go of our heritage. We cannot. Next, we head to India's Ladakh region, which produces luxurious cashmere shawls. This is how pashmina is made, using ancient methods that date back 2,000 years. And here, workers keep this ancient tradition alive. From herding the goats, harvesting the wool, weaving it together, and dyeing the fabric. In Western countries, pashmina is known as cashmere, with a C. But this unique fabric originated in the Himalayan region of Kashmir, with a K, the disputed region between India, Pakistan, and China. Pashmina of Ladakh is considered one of the best the animals graze in very high altitude. The food they eat, the, the grass they eat, they are very different than the rest of the world, you know? On today's episode, we'll see what it takes to make a pure pashmina shawl and what makes this fabric remarkable. Nowadays, China mass produces most of the global cashmere fabric, and these shawls have become widely popular across the U.S. But traditional pashmina from Kashmir, made with centuries-old methods, is rare to find. To do all this painstaking work, it requires a robust workforce. An owner, Sunam Churul, hires only women, many of them facing tough circumstances, some abandoned by husbands or parents. Each pashmina begins with wool combed from goats herded in the region's expansive highlands. The wool comes from the soft undercoat of the goats. 
and each animal only produces a little over a pound of wool a year. From here, the fiber goes to studios where it's cleaned and woven. Pashmina wool passes through many hands in the early stages. The shawl and pashmina industry is still a major contributor to the region's economy, but it's seen a decline at the end of the 20th century thanks to a rise in modern technology, competition from other countries, and a decrease in demand because of cheaper imitation shawls. And although lockdowns imposed by India's government in Kashmir don't affect this Himalayan region as much as Srinagar, business owners still feel the impact. Sunam also worries about Chinese pashmina copies. यहाँ से पश्मीना ले जाके उन माँ मिक्स करके केमिकल डाल के उसमें छोटा छोटा कट के काट के मशीन में डाल के एक जैसा बना के लाते हैं किसी पेश मतलब पहचानना मुश्किल होता है हमें तो होता है बाकी कस्टमर को मुश्किल होता है एक जैसा बना के But authenticity is still prized by certain customers. Nuang Funtsok sells the locally produced pashmina to customers all over the world. Tourism is the only industry we have in Leh. And of course then, tourists is our main customer, you know. And everybody, every tourist want to get something souvenir from Leh. So if there is no tourist, there will be no people to buy my product. Despite the grueling work, Sunam sustains a livelihood for herself and the women she employs. And she's proud of it. कोई कोई होता है किसी को धक्का लगता है किसी को खर्चे का होता है किसी को बच्चे का टेंशन होता है किसी को पति का बड़ा बहुत सारा प्रॉब्लम जो पूछने वाला तो उनको मैं बताते हैं ऐसे ऐसे कारों ये रास्ता दिखाते हैं बाकी कोई नहीं पूछेंगे तो हम जबरदस्ती क्यों उनको सौंपेंगे है ना In a remote Kashmiri village we meet Manohar who hangs from cliffs to find a supposed miracle aphrodisiac The valley of Padar is one of the most remote regions in Jammu and Kashmir. And Manohar Lal is the only one in his small village who dares to harvest shilajit. Mara gaon ka koi banda is pani mein jaana nahi chahta bol de ye dangerous kaam hai. Today he's heading out with his son Lakshmi and their friend Aditya. The journey to the Pir Panjal range in the lower Himalayas will take them about 2 to 3 days jab pehle gaye the dar to bada dangerous wal rasta tha dar to lag hi jata hai jaunlo mein to bahalo bhi hota hai reach bhi hota hai to thoda dekh ke jana padta hai they're going to climb up 12000 feet That's the height at which shilajit forms in the Himalayas. It's also found in Russia, Tibet, and even the north of Chile. After 10 hours of hiking, the men spot some deposits. But they're sitting on a steep rock wall, and the only way of getting there is climbing. <laughs> Now Manohar is on his own. He uses nothing but his own body for support. 
It's mind over matter, walking on the edge at 12,000 feet. Dangerous as 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 a parta, deke jana parta, aga kahi pisil ge, to marvisake, gir jate. Finally, he reaches the black Shilajit rocks. It's hard like cement, so he needs a chisel to break it off. They're found in the cracks and crevices of mountains where rain and snow can't get in. It forms when microorganisms decompose certain plants over centuries. What's left behind is shilaji. Manohar usually extracts it in spring and then again in fall before the snow can get to it. After collecting about 500 grams, they call it a day and set up a camp to stay overnight. Everybody is trying to be healthy and uh, eat good food. So, uski wajah se log chahte to hain unko shilajit mile. Shilajit has its roots in Ayurvedic medicine, which originated in India over 3,000 years ago. It's a traditional healing system that uses natural products. And ancient texts talk about its healing powers. But shilajit can't be eaten in its raw form. So Manohar first cooks the rocks. They dissolve in boiling water. He filters out sand and other impurities. We do this filtration around sometimes, two or five times, until we see that impurities are not in it. Here in Kashmir, they have a unique recipe for it. There is also written in the old Shastra, and traditionally, in Jammu and Kashmir, they make a little bit of gomutra, a little bit of desi ghee, a little bit of desi ghee, the remaining mixture gets sticky as it hardens, forming an edible shilajit paste. Research in shilajit is limited, but Ayurvedic experts say that it is rich in metallic compounds, minerals, and nutrients. And it's especially effective for treating infertility. They did find that the sperm count increased. They also saw an increase in testosterone levels, as well as things like energy, muscle growth, not just in men, but also in women. It also contains fulvic acid, which is set to boost immunity and reduce inflammation. And some studies show that shilajit could help treat cognitive disorders. With Alzheimer's, it's been shown to decrease the accumulation of the tau protein. And the tau protein is the protein that accumulates increased plaques in the brain and leads to Alzheimer's. Like most dietary supplements, Shilajit is not regulated by the FDA. And there are tons of fake products on the market. So Aditya Sumbria ensures that his products are the real thing by going along with Manohar on the hunt. Scarcity has key. बहुत रेयर है, बहुत डिफिकल्ट है इसको ढूंढना। तो उसकी वजह से मतलब मैक्सिमम लोगों को ओरिजिनल चीज नहीं मिल पाती है। The fakes usually come in powder form and may be adulterated with coal and fertilizers. Others contain a mineral wax called azokarite, which looks like shilajit but has no medicinal value. The most potent kind of shilajit is said to contain traces of gold. But it's very rare and expensive, selling for about $60 for just two and a half teaspoons. The overall market for infertility supplements like Shilajit is also booming. It's expected to reach $3 million by 2030. Still, some places like Whole Foods have banned Shilajit altogether. 
it's like from the earth, the risk of it having the heavy metals or the mycotoxins may be greater than other herbs. And perhaps there were some, you know, adverse effects when they weren't purified properly. That's why experts say it's best to check the product's authenticity by asking for a certificate of analysis. And usually this document is a simple document. It's just what they've done to make sure that what you are purchasing is what it is, in fact. And the second piece of it is also just looking at what testing have they done. Manohar's wife fears for him every time he goes on these hikes. Farming is impossible during the harsh winters. So the extra income from Shilajit really helps them get by. Risky में ये वो उठा लेते हैं क्योंकि हमें स्कूल मतलब फीस ये वो सब कुछ है तो उन्हें करना ही होता है। Shilajit is part of the family's daily diet too. Manohar boils milk and adds it in. एक बार मेरा ये फैक्चर हो गया था पाँव। उस टाइम पर मैंने कुछ 100 ग्राम खाया था। नेक्स्ट टाइम मेरे ख्याल में कोई 50 परसेंट किसी फर्क हुआ था। for him, using Shilajit is a tradition that goes back generations. I Now, he's happy to say he's continuing that legacy. In neighboring Nepal, a tribe has been harvesting hallucinogenic honey for generations but it isn't easy. The village of Sildunga sits about 6,000 feet above sea level. 64 families live here, and they're all involved in the hunt for honey. Everyone comes together the day before for the Maruni dance, which celebrates good over evil. The next day, Man, the village's main honey hunter, gets the handmade bamboo ladder ready. They keep essentials to the minimum, ropes, buckets and gear to protect against bee stings. They're heading to Tarebhir, a cliff where they've hunted for thousands of years. It's a three-hour drive. The village elder leads the commencement ritual. At the bottom of the cliff, they start a fire to smoke out the beads. <laughs> At the top, another group assembles the ladder. Then they tie it to a tree and slowly move it down the cliff. Man climbs down the ladder barefoot for the best grip. He's about 80 stories above ground. Mm. 
But for safety, Mun ties himself to the ladder by a rope. That's his only harness. As the bees swarm around him, he puts his hands in his pocket to protect them from stings. He still remembers the time when he was attacked by bees three years ago. The stings are painful, and to avoid fainting, Mun rubs honey into his hands. But he's trading one risk for another, because the honey makes his hands slippery. Still, it has been 30 years since a honey hunter died on the job. Man uses his 12-foot-long stick called a tango to cut the honeycomb. <laughs> Finally, he breaks off the comb. 800 feet below, a plastic sheet catches it. They collected eight combs, leaving behind 36 others. The next day, hunters head back to the village and start extracting the honey. Man says it's more abundant, stronger and sweeter in the spring. The smaller combs usually have the most, about 500 ounces. Locals celebrate the hunter's safe return in a tradition called shosho. It's meant to settle any nerves the men had during the hunt. These customs have been passed down for generations in Nepal, where people have been using this honey as a natural medicine since 1300 BC. They believe that it cures respiratory issues and that it works as an antiseptic and an aphrodisiac. <laughs> While scientists are still researching the effects of mad honey, global demand has exploded in recent years. And that has led to over-harvesting, with foreign groups coming in to hunt for their own honey in the Gurung's land. So the Gurungs found a solution to regain control. And there's a reason why it's home to the very uncommon mad honey. The largest honeybee species in the world, measuring up to 1.2 inches, lives here. The Apis laboriosa nest in altitudes, ranging from 3,000 to 10,000 feet above sea level. And they feed on a specific type of rhododendron that has a neurotoxin in its nectar. That's what triggers hallucinations. But climate change is causing the flowers to bloom unpredictably. The bee population is also shrinking because of natural disasters like wildfires, heavier rainfall, and extreme temperature changes. This all means less honey. In 2022, the village harvested about four gallons of honey compared to about 40 gallons in 2017. Half of the honey is distributed evenly to every single villager. The rest goes to markets in Nepal. Other cliffs across the Himalayas and Turkey also have mad honey. And it sells online for hundreds of dollars. But this village makes only $1,800 on average every year from honey sales. Honey is 
त्यो बेलामा चाहिँ हुन्छ सो इट्स नट रियली अबाउट द मनी मोस्ट पीपल हियर रिलाय ऑन फार्मिंग फर स्टडी इनकम लाइक मन्स फादर But he participates in all of the hunting traditions like every villager. Man began hunting in his early 40s when the Gurungs believe a man is in the prime of his life. Before that he worked construction jobs in Malaysia. In fact, 56% of Nepali families have at least one person working and living abroad because of the lack of jobs in the country. They send home more than 8 billion dollars a year in remittances. Man's son is also a construction worker. Roma level 1 ma jai kaam garna ko lagi jai kaam ko silsila ma jai qadar ma gaja. But man hopes he will come home soon to carry on the tradition of honey hunting. Tala bhir ma jani aba mai bhanam na pahile jai mai goyan da haina tara ma madhe sikera pani bhaina da mero bhai mero chhora haina Our next stop is in Tibet, where you can find a unique fungus that sells for $125 for only a gram. Caterpillar fungus grows in the remote Tibetan plateau and Himalayan mountains, but that's not the only place you can find it. You can also find it in New York City's Chinatown. Here, nestled among countless drawers of dried mugwort leaves and hibiscus flowers, there it is. a small pile of 50 or so pieces of dried caterpillar fungus here one gram of it costs about $30 but that's a steal vendors on eBay for example will try to get away with listing a gram for $125 the price is so high simply because this hybrid creature is incredibly rare it shows up only for a few weeks each year in the remote regions of Nepal Tibet India and Bhutan And even there the fungus can still be tricky for collectors to find hidden amongst a sea of grass. For centuries it's been a staple of traditional Tibetan and Chinese medicine. Traditionally it was used as a sort of general tonic um for immune support. So for instance a family might add some of it to chicken soup to make you feel better. It's even rumored that it can be used as some sort of Himalayan Viagra. though there's little evidence to back that claim up people also buy the fungus as a gift or use it for bribes or as a status symbol as a result better looking pieces fetch a higher price it's all dependent on exactly the color of the caterpillar fungus like even say the shape of its body when it died um all these things that don't necessarily have anything to do with medicinal value make all the difference for um the economic value In 2017, for example, high-quality pieces sold for as much as $140,000 per kilo or about $63,000 per pound. Now, caterpillar fungus has always been pricey, but experts say its value really skyrocketed in the 1990s and 2000s because of a growing Chinese economy. The resulting increase in disposable income ultimately helped drive a massive boom in harvest. In the Tibetan Autonomous Region, for example, collectors reportedly hauled out more than 3 times as much caterpillar fungus in the early 2000s than they did in the 80s. And now, many families depend on the cash it brings in. In fact, experts say that up to 80% of household income in the Tibetan Plateau and Himalayas can come from selling caterpillar fungus. Just one district in Nepal reported collecting 4.7 million dollars worth of caterpillar fungus in 2016. That is 12% more than the district's annual budget. But those profits are at risk. Surveys indicate that the annual harvests have recently declined. The collectors themselves mostly attributed this to overharvesting, um acknowledging that their own collection pressure was driving these declines. and it doesn't help that it's difficult to regulate the harvest and all these uh, different political units have uh, different policies 
And in the end, it is really down to county level and how it's implemented. And climate change is also causing problems. The fungus is more abundant in areas with cold, long winters, which are increasingly hard to come by. We end our journey where we started, in Kashmir, which is home to this floating market where farmers grow and sell crops on the famous Dal Lake. Every morning at sunrise, Kashmiri farmers gather at Srinagar's famous floating market on Dal Lake. Muhammad Sadiq Khan paddles half a mile to get there from his home to the other side of the water. Just a decade ago, Muhammad would have met up with hundreds of other sellers. These days, though, there are just a few dozen left. Most of their families have traded here for generations. Srinagar's floating market has survived decades of conflict, political upheaval, and natural disasters. But today, the lake itself is at risk. Sewage dumping and pollution are suffocating the waters farmers depend on. We went to Dal Lake in Indian-administered Kashmir to find out how this floating market is still standing. Roughly 60,000 people depend on Dal Lake for their livelihoods. Many work in tourism and fishing. But the lake's agriculture is one of its most important industries. On this cold winter morning, Muhammad picks up collard greens to sell. What makes them unique is how they're grown. People began farming inside the lake centuries ago. Over time, generations of farmers passed down their methods. What was this? I just got out of the boat. I was going to go to the boat. I was going to go to the boat. I was going to go to the boat. These floating gardens are called Rad in Kashmiri. Some grow naturally, others are artificial. Farmers weave together wetland plants and bring up the roots and soil from the bottom of the lake to layer into what is essentially a floating mat. They plant collard leaves, turnips, carrots and other produce. But the market's most popular crop actually grows under the water. The lotus root, locally known as nadru, is used in many Kashmiri dishes. And Dal Lake is considered one of the region's best producers. The floating market runs every day for two hours, even in the dead of winter. Farmers wear an iconic woolen overcoat called a peran to keep warm. They share a traditional Kashmiri green tea called kahwa that's mixed with cinnamon, cardamom, and saffron. And they wait for shopkeepers who travel from the city to buy their vegetables. It's a ritual that has been going on for at least a hundred years. The market Floating markets like this one were once a central part of life across Asia. They date back to the 14th century, but most still around today are less than 200 years old. They popped up in places like Vietnam, Thailand, and parts of India, 
where rivers, wetlands and coastlines were the main routes for transporting people and goods. So trading on the water made a lot of sense. But as infrastructure improved and roads were built in these areas, vendors started to move their goods by land. By the mid-20th century, floating markets throughout Asia became tourist attractions, like Dal Lake's market. Visitors filled the hundreds of houseboats lining the lake. They'd take rides in small boats called shikaras to get an up-close look at the floating market. By the 1980s, tourism became a thriving industry. When you're a tourist, you're not a tourist. But Kashmir lies on a political and religious fault line, and that has made it hard to keep attracting visitors. India and Pakistan began to fight over the territory after they gained independence from British rule in 1947. Unrest flared up again in the 1990s, and fighting between separatists and Indian security forces drove most tourists away. Despite ongoing conflict, farmers here kept growing and selling produce from their boats every morning for decades. But in 2014, devastating floods brought everything to a halt for the first time in the market's history. I just sorry, Abiyah. Dal Lake was virtually deserted. The market stopped. It took farmers months to recover. Eventually, more than a year later, things began to pick up again. But as Srinagar's population grew, so did its environmental problems. By the 1980s, locals were complaining about the sewage being dumped from hundreds of houseboats. Studies show they're one of the lake's biggest polluters. But that's just one part of a massive waste problem. The government admitted that more than 44 million liters of sewage from the city was being dumped into the lake every day. That's enough to fill more than 17 Olympic-sized swimming pools. The government announced it would connect all houseboats to sewage plants last year. It banned plastic on the lakeshore and ordered mechanical dredgers to scoop out invasive weeds and other kinds of waste. But even a cleaned up Dal Lake would still face yet another challenge. <laughs> Mohammed says farming hasn't been profitable enough to entice the next generation. In fact, some vegetables cost him more to grow than what he can sell them for. And competition has grown fierce. It's why many farmers are unsure about the future of the market. Some have left farming or work other jobs just to get by. Muhammad makes just enough to care for himself and his wife Salima Jan. But he refuses to let that discourage him. He has hope that the lake, its floating gardens, and the market will survive. Muhammad 
آسانی خداوند بریم خدایش چه سوری؟